On today's show, Arnold Candry joins us to take on globalization and international trade. Candry's years of military service have taken him around the world, giving him a distinct expertise on the military's role in commercialization of developing markets to trade in a global economy. All that and more on Tuesday noon for October 10, 2006. Welcome to Tuesday Noon. We're back. Another Tuesday, another noon, and uh, we're on a road trip. We are. This is it's a exciting. very, very exciting uh, week for us. It's our first on-location uh, session here. We have. We are in the lovely, the lovely village of Seattle, the lovely village of Renton, outside yes. of the yes. larger uh, village of Seattle. <laughs> uh, every time I'm I sure they appreciate uh, being labeled a village. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't even started with my Grey's Anatomy associations yet. That's all I think about anymore. <laughs> Need to hit Seattle. Great. So, how is everybody? I'm sitting here around the table with the lovely and talented Mary Bradbury. Uh, hey, welcome back, Mary. Yes, thank you. Mary, it's good to have thank you. you. You guys did a great job last week. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It was hard without you. There's no doubt. It Xander is okay, right? Xander's great. Xander's good. And yes. across from you, we have the talented and lovely Jamie Whitley. <laughs> Oh, that so was the self described <laughs> lovely and talented. I screwed that up. I was, no, cut that, cut that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and we're here, we're joined with a, uh, a special guest, a Seattle uh, a resident faculty member, and we're, we're very glad to have him. Mary, you were going to do, the, uh, do the honors? I am. We have with us uh, Arnie Candre, and he teaches uh, for the Seattle campus, and his uh, primary area of emphasis is in around global management, international business. Global Strategies. How long have you been teaching with the university? Uh, actually, I started when the campus opened in 98, summer of uh, 98. Wow, so you've watched it here a long grown time. with yeah. it. So I'm probably one of the original faculty here. So how'd, you, so. how'd you run into us in 98? Well, uh, it was out on the freeway, and uh, <laughs> the... Uh, Guy no, actually, did, you, did you find us on a bus ad? <laughs> Tell me you found us on a bus. No, actually, what I'll happened is I was actually down in the Bay Area in San Francisco and out in Danville in the East Bay Area and where I have originally grew up in the Marin County Bay Area and uh, I went back there on business and stayed there and had been there for a number of years and I actually started uh, uh, looking at uh, teaching for the university at the Pleasanton campus so I went in and actually started processing uh, to become a faculty member there and about the time when I was just like in the middle of processing, I hadn't even gotten into anything serious yet, uh, I had a, uh, I had a very uh, exciting offer, which I couldn't refuse, a uh, corporate offer, to relocate up to Seattle. Uh, I was in the telecommunications business, and they wanted me to come up here, and it was a program to develop their international uh, distributorships of their uh, marketing and selling arm overseas, and they had a, had a kind of a track record on the things I had done before down there and as a result I came up to Seattle and about the time I came up here shortly after that I did see an ad in the paper <laughs> where we are looking for people with specific certain areas and one of them was global business and um, I called uh, down to the local uh, the local manager at the time was Alan Emmett who was the first campus manager here outstanding individual who I have nothing but plotted for uh, the individual and all the things he did to build this campus. And uh, he wanted to know if I could be there by 4 o'clock that afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the classroom by yeah. 6 tonight. <laughs> yeah, and could I start teaching the following? <laughs> literally, we accelerated things, and I was literally teaching almost within two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Was, That's fantastic. Yeah. So I enjoyed it, and since then, it's, I've enjoyed all the situations. Growing with us Growing with here. the campus. That's fantastic. And, because I think we had, I think, 20 faculty to start with, and now we're pushing 200 area. So it's, right. it's increased a little bit since then. Just a smidge. Excellent. Just a smidge. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you have a, a very impresso, impressive bio. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And Well, uh, how would you get here from there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. To begin with, I was born. <laughs> so Those were the days. days. Yeah. <laughs> no, I... Uh, I guess everything in my life has evolved from uh, a very unusual uh, upbringing in that uh, both my parents were immigrants. Uh, my father originally came to the University of California, Berkeley, as a government scholarship student from El Salvador. And he came in to study uh, electrical engineering, and he finished as a nuclear physicist, if you can believe wow. it, back in the 30s. And he went on to spend many years with uh, U.S. Navy R&D and then with uh, Lockheed Missiles and Space Division in the Bay Area. 
and spent a long time there. And my mother uh, came here from Germany, she's from Berlin, uh, and she and her uh, father and all came to San Francisco in the uh, late 20s, and kind of a very sh short sideline, but my, uh, my parents met at the German club in San Francisco, which was the place where all the university students went in the... Uh, in that time frame, it was the meeting place for the Stanford, Cal Berkeley, St. Mary's, San Francisco State, and my mother did some work for the German consular office in San Francisco before World War II, and so of course those young ladies were invited to make an appearance at the Surely. German club, and yeah. that's where they met my father, and the rest was history. They ended cool. up getting yeah, they ended up getting married before World War II. And in many ways, uh, that made sure my mother didn't have to go back to Germany right. when the war started yeah. as a right. result of that. Definitely. And my father came into Marin Shipyards in Sausalito with the original engineering team from Kaiser Shipbuilding there and bought our home there in Marin County, and that's where I grew up. In a beautiful, beautiful area, and yes, never it forgot it, and the quality of life in those years was just incredible. So right. It's beautiful. And so that was where I grew up, went to high school and all of that. And then I actually uh, originally had received a, uh, a, uh, a, scholar, a Navy ROTC scholarship to go to Princeton University as a, as a cadet under their ROTC program. And at the last minute, uh, like 30 days prior to, after I'd been processed to go to Princeton and everything, they pulled my application saying that, unfortunately, there was another cadet who had to be requalified and turned in, I found out it was a legacy, Princeton legacy person. Mm -hmm. So he ended up taking my slot to uh, to Princeton. Hmm. So I did not become an Ivy Leaguer, and uh, a, a high school classmate of mine, uh, parents said to me, he said, well, you know, you ought to look into uh, this offer from the University of Idaho. And I said, where? <laughs> I mean, is that we, anywhere near New Jersey? Yeah, is that, is that just, is that south of the Canadian border? Or north of the Canadian Princeton border? Princeton or Idaho? Especially Princeton? when they throw out Moscow, yeah. Idaho. Yeah, Moscow, oh, Idaho. Yeah, that's the, true. Uh, the cow tipping capital of the world. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. And they said, well, you know, you're on a lot of the film that uh, their son is on. We played football track and all the athletics at those time. And he said, I think the coach has seen you. And and next thing I knew, two days later, I got a call from a football coach up at uh, Idaho, and he said, well, if, if you're available, I think we can work out something for you, combined track football, da da, da. So, so you got I, booted from the ROTC placement at I Princeton, got booted and you got into Idaho on football. Uh, football and track. And track. And, but I immediately did go into ROTC, but it was Air Force ROTC that I ended up going into for a lot of reasons. For one thing, you just didn't have to carry rifles that, the army and the navy had to carry rifles. So yeah. I thought this is plus everything just smacked of a little bit higher education and background and all the opportunities I thought were that the Air Force offered were much better. And I've never regretted that decision all my life. <laughs> How long were you in the Air Force? In the uh, end? I was actually uh, just under 21 years in the wow. Air Force. So I originally I went directly to flight training after I got out of college and um, spent 21 years in. But I had a very unusual career path in the Air Force, and so it took me into a lot of assignments and places that the average person would never ever see or do. But I went into kind of like the diplomatic core area and the work I ended up doing. So that took me to places like Panama and Taiwan and those where I was working in and out with the U.S. embassies and those types of things that were quite unusual. So then that kind of launched your area of emphasis in international business in That general. was a springboard that uh, I always had an interest uh, in the uh, international uh, arena. And I, to back up just a second, I did travel a lot when I was younger. My parents took me on a lot of their trips. My father was on, sent on overseas trips, and my mother accompanied him. And so I would go with them on trips out of the country. And so I did, at a young age, start to cool. see different cultures. And I did originally learn German, and I learned Spanish as a child. And unfortunately, I'd forgotten most to that, but when I'm traveling overseas, it all comes back to me, and I understand what they're saying. Well, if you need help with Spanish, you can listen to our last episode. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Speak shop folks. Speak shop folks, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're currently doing? <clears throat> okay, um, currently uh, my my own uh, company is doing uh, importing uh, work, uh, working with a manufacturer in Shanghai uh, in China, and we are working to bring in housewares, ceramic items, ut 
utilitarian houseware items uh, to like what? you like uh, salt and pepper shakers, okay. pitchers, things you can actually use as opposed to decor only items that you can only look at. But it's kind of an upscale uh, positioning on the market of the items that we're bringing in, and right now we're under. Uh, under negotiations with some of the major, major retailers. Mm -hmm. And as I sit here today, one of my people is out actually talking with um, with some of the major retailers, and they've already indicated, because this all went before we went to China to contract to look at how we can manufacture some of these items. So it offered me an opportunity to uh, get into, for the or not get into, but to visit China for the first time. I hadn't ever visited there, although I have... Uh, I did have a chance to, I may have mentioned earlier, a chance to live in Taiwan for, for three years, which gave me an initial exposure to Chinese culture. Uh, we had a Chinese cook and a couple of Chinese houseboys and everything else when I lived, because I lived uh, on the local economy when I was in Taiwan. And my only regret is that I didn't learn some Chinese when I was there, but uh, I was doing so much flying at that time. I was flying C-130s uh, out of a local uh, Chinese air base that it was a dual U.S. Chinese air base and we would be gone for like uh, three weeks out of every month sent from Taiwan to either Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos or one of those or Thailand and we would spend three weeks down there and then come back to, to Taiwan. So it was an interesting situation and of course that is another whole story on itself on all the things that happened with that. But uh, currently I'm involved in this uh, Chinese manufacturing project, and we're looking to try to get that thing pulled together here within the next uh, 30, 60, 90 days. So you, you're really familiar then with the uh, production process in China, the, the outsourcing for American companies, if I wanted to have salt shakers made or whatever it is. So you're, you're very versed in that and what it takes. And I... I would have to say that I at least I have familiarity in those okay. areas. I've been All exposed right. to those areas, and I'm aware of, of, of maybe perhaps some of the uh, pitfalls that you can run into. Are there little children working for one cent an hour and I, China uh, I, making soccer balls? Yeah. Personally, I'll say I never did witness any children working. Uh, the closest I'd say I ever came is I did have an opportunity to visit a, um, a uh, silk rug tapestry manufacturing plant. And in there, this, very, this was in China. Or this was in uh, in in Shanghai and in Chongqing, which is at the western terminus of the Yangtze River. Mm -hmm. I did have the opportunity to take the river trip for three days, four days. That goes That's from enough. north of Wuhan, north of Shanghai, and it goes for four days west on the Yangtze to uh, to um, Chongqing. And that was another incredible trip because we were seeing the Three Gorges Dam being finished, and it's a year ahead of schedule, and it's going to be an incredible situation where wow. they, nothing else, they hope to clean up the air because they'll have an electric power source, hydro, right. as opposed to uh, coal. Everything is coal. And they hope to clean up a quarter of the country by doing that, and especially they hope to clean things up before the 08 Olympics up mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, what I was going to say is that in the manufacturing of these silk tapestries, they have to bring in girls that are 18, no older, and they can only do this for about four years because their eyes are so fine looking at the very fine threads as they're weaving these tapestries, these very fine tapestries. And the person who was showing us through there said that actually their eyes give out at about 25, and then they, they're sent on to other jobs in in the pl manufacturing process, but they can no longer do this fine threading of these lines of tapestry. It's just mm -hmm. So that was really about the only time I really saw young people, mm -hmm. and the girls in there were, as, I guess, as young as 15 years old, but, but uh, usually they were more in the area of age 20, 19, 20. What do we take for granted in that circumstance? I mean, here we are, we, we are consumers of these products. We're consumers of these tapestries at some level. And yet, you know, what are we taking for granted when we when we make these purchases, I mean, when you're, you hear the arguments uh, over there, it's part of the economy. It's part of the engine that keeps this that keeps this economy moving and growing and prospering. But at what point are we taking advantage of a system that may be deleterious for our long-term commerce? Mm -hmm. The uh, one of the things that uh, that. Uh, that I recently uh, 
became more aware of was I had uh, had had a colleague here locally. He doesn't teach for the university, but we had shared a lot of experiences. He actually uh, is the general manager of a local Danish shipping company and with their headquarters in Copenhagen, but he operates out of Seattle, been here about 10 years now, and he was sharing with me, and he makes a lot of trips back and forth to China. And he said, right now, there are figures because they do a lot of the shipping of goods, and he said, do you know right now that almost 80% of U.S appliances with U.S. names on them, like the Sears, the Craftsman, and Kenmore, and all those, they are actually manufactured in China today. Eighty percent. Eighty percent. Of our appliances that are typically construed as made-in-America products. Exactly. Come out of China What today. does made-in-America mean <laughs> anymore? Yeah, these don't normally say made-in-America. Yeah. And the other interesting statistic uh, that he shared with, with me was that today... Walmart has a larger import of goods from China and does more trade with China than the United Kingdom does. Wow. So, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Walmart has greater trade with China than UK. Exactly. Wow. And so that That's kind of stunning. tends to put things in perspective. And so we know that, that American companies are falling more and more the victims of... of uh, of outsourcing because they have to cut the bottom line. Their biggest overhead is is, uh, is employment, is employment payroll. They have to do things like that. It was interesting. I just noted here, uh, having served in the Vietnam era and my own personal thoughts about what goes on over there and all that, and I just noticed that on November 18th, President Bush is going to Hanoi, North Vietnam, to sit there for the opening of the APEC uh, conference, which is an annual Asian uh, Pacific uh, economic summit that is held, and it's in Hanoi. And how far we have come that he's going there, and of course uh, two of the senators from uh, from North Carolina, one of them is Elizabeth Dole, are really up in arms because part of this whole thing is to allow for the Vietnamese uh, sh- uh, shipment to the U.S. of fabrics and woolen goods and tapestries and things like that, which cut against the grain of the North uh, of the North Carolina U.S. mills, and these oh, people now are going to suffer. So, of course, the senators from North Carolina would have a good stake, and they're trying to lobby uh, President Bush to say certain things to kind of rent to call this under uh, control so things like that happen. But the fact that we now have a sitting U.S. president visiting Hanoi here on November 18th, it's I think it's, it's an amazing step in direction of globalization in the world, which is the topic that I well, teach in a lot of my classes. Isn't that really what it is? There's that book that came out recently called talking about the world is flat. And, we, and, and everything mm-hmm. becomes driven by economics. And, and as, as borders drop and tariffs and free trade comes up, then it becomes... How can you produce things better, faster, cheaper? And the reason we outsource is because if we can get something over there for five bucks and here it would cost twenty bucks to make, we consumers demand a product. We're not going to pay the forty dollars or sixty dollars in my example that it would finally be at the retail place. We want to pay the ten to fifteen that would finally be. So you have to outsource, otherwise you can't compete because we aren't willing to pay that kind of money. And so. In a lot of ways, we're our own worst enemies when it comes to why do we outsource in these textiles. And yes, politicians are going to be up in arms because it cuts jobs short term, but long term it's healthy for the economy. But that's hard to say when you're trying to feed your family. I mean, that's the economic yeah. downside. I think. Well, uh, but, you, you, but with that, you have to have other businesses starting up out of this country as you let businesses leave. Right. So that. Do we? Doesn't appear to. Or do we have them? I don't know. Other than the service industry, uh, service defense, but, you know. I think that was the uh, one of the observations in Thomas Friedman's book, "The World Is Flat." Uh, as you know, he's a foreign uh, foreign correspondent, chief foreign correspondent for the New York Times, and has written a number of excellent pieces. Mm-hmm. And I actually use the book "The World Is Flat" as a recommended reading in my global courses because mm-hmm. I feel here's a way for students to expand some of their thinking and and maybe get a little better grasp of what's going on in the world on the other side of the hemisphere, (laughs) other side of the world. And he talks about uh, 
we have leveled the playing field. I mean, it's the convergence of what's going on today in, in technologies and in services and uh, how this has allowed countries like India and China, and I would like to add Brazil, who I feel uh, have made several business trips to Brazil and seen what goes on there and how they are trying to uh, also come up uh, all the things from trying to get a seat on the Security Council of the United Nations, being a major player. And, and I noticed they were invited along with India and China to the last G8 meeting. Uh, these countries were invited because uh, there's a lot of respect for their industrial capacity, capability, and progress. Are they the country that's cut their, um, their use of uh, fossil fuels? Dramatically, is that is it Brazil or yeah, thinking? Well, oh. they have they have gone to uh, sugarcane alcohol, which That's they use. Is. And right. if you pull into a typical service station mm -hmm. in downtown Rio or Sao Paulo, you will have another pump that will be for I want to say ethanol, but it's it's a, it's a sugarcane based fuel, and which you can put into your car. And of course, that means the carburetors down there are different. And you will see like Porsche and Volkswagen, and they have models there that we don't have in the U.S. We don't even have in Europe. And these cars take this sugarcane uh, fuel. Um, one thing I would like to mention is that I did have a personal experience in Brazil that I think is pretty relevant and it pretty well dramatizes uh, what I observed. I had, when I was uh, still with uh, my DOD state affiliation, and I had gone on an inspection trip up to Brasilia in uh, the capital of Brazil, mm -hmm. and this was in the mid 80s. And at that time, I noticed we flew from Rio de Janeiro up to Brasilia, and it's normally a two-hour flight. And when we flew up there, I noticed that halfway up there, the uh, pilot came on and he said, oh, if you look out the window now, you'll see the beginning of the Amazon. And all the way the next hour, we flew in and landed in Brasilia, which is a very futuristic city. It's something out of sci-fi. It's You can't believe the architecture in the building. And Brazilian architecture is beautiful always anyway, but these buildings were incredible. And these buildings are all sticking out of the jungle because the whole idea was to put the capital in the jungle so people would be driven inland. They're not all sitting on the seacoast. So the uh, so that happened in about 85. So about uh, 1994, about 20 years later, or not 20, about 10 years later, 85, I fly down there again uh, on a business trip, and I make the same flight from Brasilia, from Rio de Janeiro to Brasilia. And on the way over there, the um, the uh, I keep looking out the window, and we're still on the plains, no jungle or anything like that. And so pretty soon the pilot comes on, and he says, we're about to uh, descend into Brasilia to fasten your seatbelts. And I look to the guy who was sitting next to me, and I said, how can that be? I said, we haven't even hit the jungle yet. He said, jungle? He says, there is no jungle in Brasilia anymore. He says, you have to go about 300 miles north of Brasilia now to see the jungle. Well, that was such a dramatic view of the cutback of the world's largest ecosystem, the Amazon jungle. And I have seen that today we're losing almost 5,000 acres a day of the Amazon jungle that is being cut back for farming and all the things. And the Brazilian government uh, is trying to cut this down and all kinds of penalties, but they still can't control. I mean, it's a vast, vast resource. But, I mean, it was so shocking, dramatic to wow. me to, to see there is no jungle in Brasilia anymore. It's just all buildings standing out in this cut-out um, savanna. Well, it gets to that same issue. How long is that sustainable mm -hmm. in Central and South America in, in terms of natural resources? How long is it sustainable in Asia in terms of human resources? human capital resources, manufacturing resources. I mean, at what point, uh, at, at what point does, does this normalize? You know, at what point does it either normalize or fall apart? Well, I don't think we should paint it doom and gloom that it's all going to fall apart. It's and November we're gonna, 8th, we're gonna run actually, out of, 2017. We're going to run out of oil. We run out of everything. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the world's, uh, and, yeah, we're all in big trouble. It, it, it's not going to happen like that. It just certainly is this decline, and... Of course, the the economist would tell you that. Well, the hope is is that technology and the smarts of people will figure out ways to adapt and change, and that so over time we will continue to sustain. And then we're all not. They're just not going to go up in a ball of fire in the next 
six months because we're cutting down the rainforest. Mm -hmm. That's the theory. <laughs> That's the theory. But it's still... Oh, man, aren't you going to be busted if I'm right? right. Or what are the long-term ramifications? <laughs> but that's, 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 yeah, I, I, it, it's that's clearly the tragic. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. It's, yeah. it's clearly tragic, and, and we need to be more responsible as, mm -hmm. as human beings. But if you're, if you're in a country that doesn't have anything and you're trying to come up and you, don't, you take advantage of your natural resources, we did the same thing here in the United States, but we're lucky we had this huge land mass versus a lot of other countries. And so they're doing exactly what we've done on a more modern as, scale. As a model citizen, right, saying that in quotes, they're doing what we did. Yes, yeah, exactly, taking advantage of the natural resources. But mm -hmm. modern technology allows us to cut down trees a lot faster. It used to, we do them by a saw on hand, so we couldn't nearly be as productive. Now we can just cut down 5,000 acres a day without, without batting an eye, and so the, the devastation becomes much larger. It's yeah. very tragic. One thing uh, a lot of Americans don't, under, don't realize is that if you took a string and put it around the periphery of Brazil, all the way around, and put that same string around continental United States that Brazil is larger. So it's actually a bigger country than the really? United States. Yeah. Yeah. Fast it's hard, wow. to, hard to conceive. But the, wow. the and it borders every country, of course, in Latin America, right. uh, wow. with the exception yeah. of... Uh, I, I have this theory, though, and talking about being overseas really? and all your travels, is that if more Americans traveled overseas and saw these things and experienced uh, third world countries and different cultures, that we would be a gentler, more accommodating society, and we wouldn't be so arrogant sometimes. Spoiled. That's an interesting Spoiled. question. I mean, I, yeah, would, would you agree with that? Do you think your yeah, experience? Yeah. I mean, it, I look at your experience, your early experience in flying planes in and out of Saigon, and you know, military experience. Well, and exposed to cultures at such a young, different cultures exactly. at such a young age too. Yeah, it was. Um, it was uh, an unusual opportunity all the way from when I traveled with my parents as a seven, eight, ten-year-old child, and then, of course, in the military, I was just about everywhere in the world also. And, but the one thing I try to emphasize with my students uh, when I teach in these global business strategy courses is to ha really have an appreciation for, uh, for uh, other people, how they live, and what they, use for, what, they are, what they are used to, and sometimes they not necessarily need to have or do what we do to be well off because in their mind's eye, they are okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the videos that I, that I recorded several years ago and I use in some of my classes to try to drive home this point is a picture, or is a uh, film called uh, Encountering Cuba. And I was there on a business trip about five years ago now. And uh, I was just blown away by uh, two things. One was uh, the incredible culture and history in Cuba, which is so different from all the rest of Latin America. And to see a lot of the people in, in Cuba that are really a lot of Spanish descendants from Spain as opposed to Latin America, you see a lot of the Indian mix, but you don't see that in, in a lot of the areas of Cuba. And uh, to see these, um, uh, when you're down like in Havana or in Santiago uh, you see, or Cienfuegos, you see the, uh, all the companies that are in there, all the signs on the street from every country in the world, whether it's Volvo or whether it's Philips or whether it's Nestle, but you don't see one American company there because they've been allowed to come in during the 40-odd years of our how successful blockade, and of course I say that facetiously, but the fact that we're the only ones not in there, and uh, it, it's just very dramatic. But what I have shown sometimes is this video that was actually made by a Canadian broadcasting company, and it shows a U.S., pardon me, a Canadian real estate developer who is in Havana and traveling around, and he's looking as to how to come in and build more commercial buildings in Havana so that they can bring in more business and do more things. And he makes so many of these observations all the way around the lo along. But during the process of that, they have encounters with different Cubans, older Cubans, younger Cubans, middle Cubans, pro-communist Cubans, anti-communist Cubans, uh, people who lived under the uh, Batista regime before Castro came to power, and then since then, and there are different perspectives on Wow. A lot of them are very anti-Castro, and they can't wait to get out of there, and they have relatives in the U.S., and they want to come. And others talk about how things maybe weren't so bad then because at those times they, 
they uh, were able to do a lot of things that they that they can't do now. But on the positive side, they talk about things like uh, me medicine, free medicine, and the fact they can go to medical school, and the fact that they can uh, that they uh, have uh, a good schooling system, a good medical system, and those are the types of things that they even have tried to export. But uh, so it's an interesting exposure to the culture, and they show young people and what they do today, whether they're practicing different forms of, of almost African uh, religions or whether they're into the latest bop, mm -hmm. medium, dance groups mm -hmm. that they put on performances. And uh, so you can see the complete cross-section of Cuba today. So I think this is an excellent film, which, which I've used. And the students just, after class, they come up to me, and we've never seen anything like that. And that just is a real eye-opener. Tell us again, what is the film called? Uh, it's uh, I'm encountering Cuba. I'm encountering Cuba. Cuba. Yeah, and I have to get you the, the. I believe that's the current. current okay. Tale. Yeah. Well, I'll look for that. We'll put yeah. that up on the website. On the well, I think that does speak to it. the more you experience other cultures, the more aware you are, and I mean. Well, the more you experience other cultures, the less fearful you are of them. Thus, the more tolerant you are of them. Yes. I think a lot of what happens is when it's unknown. So then, then we're. We're, we're scared by that. And then we have perhaps propaganda that we're told that they, you know, they all hate us or that they all, whatever it is. And then th if that's all we know, we feed off that. And yeah. yeah. The other thing I think from a culture standpoint, uh, which I witnessed on a couple of occasions was, uh, and not to jump continents, are you, but to go to Eastern Europe and Romania. And uh, I was on a on a business trip there, and uh, one of the things we did is we we were taken from Bucharest out to Brasov. Brasov is you go over the Carpathian Mountains and t on the northern side of Romania, and that's where Dracula's Castle is and all of that. We went through Dracula's Castle, and it was kind of amusing because it was November time frame, and they said, by the way, we just had a uh, private party by an Englishman in Dracula's Castle, and he paid $5,000. But he said nobody would stay the complete night in the castle. <laughs> it was oh, how fun. And we went through it and saw the whole thing. And uh, but from a what I wanted to point out from a culture standpoint is the thing I observed in Romania and I observed in Czechoslovakia and Bul Bulgaria and Hungary and other places. It's how much pro. American, a lot of their people are on the ground because they were so, told so many stories during the Cold War years about what Americans were like, what we were up to, what we were doing, and all these complete, complete uh, 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 stories that really had no resonance in fact at all. And that these people, almost to a person, uh, they love Americans. They love everything American. They want to know about you. They want to know where you went to school, what you do, what your parents are like, what do you do for fun, and all these things. And going all the way back to our conversation at the beginning where we talked about our, our students in, in Russia, the fact that uh, how, how they bonded with the, uh, with the Russian kids almost immediately. They want to take them to their house and show them things that they had. Do you have anything from America you can share with me or give me? You know, even if you have, so they were advised to take stamps and take little logo things. And it's kind of amusing all the way back to hard to find even at Kennedy Airport made in America thing. You know, even the Statue of Liberty is there now saying made in Taiwan. <laughs> but, <laughs> wow. but these these people and these, these kids and... Um, I could tell you hundreds of stories of the things I encountered and saw in Eastern Europe and in Russia. And when you go to 30 Soviet cities, uh, you wow. see things that most Russians haven't seen. And I guess it really struck me, and I really, I really uh, gathered a fondness for the Russian people because to see how much suffering they had been through and all the things they had had to contend with from the from the Tsarists to the Bolsheviks to the Leninists to the Stalinists to the Cold War years and and then even when they started to convert uh, over into capitalism and they had to go on through every one of the and the Russian people have had to suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer uh, but one of the things that got me was to go through every Russian city that I went to and there wasn't a single city where they didn't have a statue commemorating the Great War or uh, the fact that they had lost a brother or a sister a cousin or an uncle in the war. Everybody had lost Which somebody. Like yeah. Millions. We're not, yeah. I mean, yeah. we've had wars in 60,000, yeah. they yeah. lost millions. Yeah, one of, the th one of the things that I heard several times there, and I haven't been able to really ascertain the exact truth of it, is that there were something like 
dozen, half dozen major, major, major battles during World War II that were on the Eastern Front where they had almost a million men consumed in these battles. That was with the Germans fighting the Russians. Mm -hmm. That were never reported in the West because of the fact that Stalin didn't want it to get out, mm -hmm. that they had lost so many men. Mm -hmm. And these battles were never reported. And I have seen some books now where they do talk about some of these. And, and to our good fortune, that kept all the German armies in the east mm -hmm. so we didn't have to contend with them when we landed at places like Normandy and all that. I mean if we had had to face German army group center north or Caucasus in the west and they drew them all that way and that's actually what allowed us to really succeed. It gets into some of my military history political that I have an interest in but uh, I said we were just very lucky that that happened. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, well I have just uh, kind of a overarching question, which is sometimes um, when you're, you're talking to people, and especially right now where um, we're dealing with issues around our reputation and the rest of the world and the things that we're doing, the things that we're saying, and, and you've got groups of people that say we need to be caring about our reputation in other countries. We need to care about global relationships. And you will hear people come back and go, we don't need those, and that's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to our success as a country. What would you say to a person that said that to you? Well, I think uh, the big thing that, that, that students today need to understand is uh, it's to appreciate and understand ethnicities, diversities, cultures, and how things, how things operate in so many of these countries, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Latin America, or whether it's in Europe that these people think differently and they come from a different place and time. And so it's not that our way is necessarily the right way. There are other ways of looking at things and that's why we keep being hit today by constantly why, why, why is the current president imposing that we must have this form of democracy. I mean, for a thousand years we've had uh, crusades in the Middle East and they haven't done any more today than they did a thousand years ago and they were locked in there for almost 250 years at the last millennium, if you want to count. And we're trying to turn around the Middle East here in two, three years. It's very difficult for those things to happen. But American students, uh, and whenever possible, I say travel overseas, get to know business people overseas. Uh, when I go to a place that's interesting, like I, it was actually in South Korea, I was in Seoul in a business meeting there, and I observed across the restaurant from us, we were having lunchtime, there were these three uh, Asian gentlemen that were sitting there in business suits talking. One was a Korean, one was a Japanese, and one was a Chinese gentleman, and they were all speaking English to each other. And it was kind of amusing, and I was with my host and asking, I said, that is right. He says, yeah, he says, actually, that's the only way they can communicate, and that is the language of business. Mm -hmm. So to watch these three Asian gentlemen in a South Korean restaurant <laughs> speaking English was, was really kind wow. of unusual. So it was an interesting observation as far as English is used everywhere. And that's the one thing that, let's say, that American students have going for them is that if nothing else, they were going to be able to speak the common the common language of business, and that's what all the schools in the world teach. And from a young age, they start learning English because they know to succeed in the business world, they're going to have to know English. Can you give me some of your perspective on the issues in the Middle East? Now, what I'm interested in, particular, particularly that issue, is is English, you know, as going to be as interesting, and compelling of a language in the in development in the Middle East in the coming decades. But mostly because I'm looking at your experience. I mean, you've you've seen wartime in Vietnam, and yet now you're working in Vietnam and as an investor and and, and discussing APEC and discussing, you know, from this transition from war to business development mm -hmm. and, and true economies. You're looking at the Cold War and your experience in the former Soviet Union, and now, you know, as, as you look at, at increased development in the Eastern Bloc, and you're looking at Asia and China and all these things that transition from wartime to business development. How do you plot that against the Middle East? You know, when when should I be investing in in uh, you know in an Arabic company, Mid Middle Eastern uh, Middle mutual Eastern fund? Mutual fund. Yeah. I, I have one story I love about the cutting edge of when the Iron Curtain came down and capitalism in Russia, and I was into Moscow on one of my first business trips after the wall had come down. It was in the spring of '92, and. And we went actually south to Odessa in the south, and uh, we went into a meeting, and 
I was with the telecommunications company at that time. And we go in there to talk to this, uh, to this gentleman who was obviously a former pretty heavy-duty Communist Party official, and he was in charge of commerce and all that. So when we come in to sit down with him, uh, my boss at that time was traveling with me, and we go in there, and we, we come into his room, and he's got like seven phones on his desk, and the phones start ringing. Well, they didn't have a multiple line. He had to cut off each one of them and answer them independently. But after he finally put them away, he says, ah, oh, well, I'm done with the telephones. He said, ah, oh, I am so welcome you to wel- I am so glad to welcome you here from America. He says, okay, let's do some kind of business. What kind of business do you want to do? And he wrapped his hands together. <laughs> and my boss and I looked at each other. What kind of business do we want to do? And I said, this is the new age communism. This is the new age Russia. And I love that. This is the expression on this guy's face. And we all looked at each other and well, what does he think we're here for? But in his mind's eye is we represented the West. We represented America, and we represented the new era of the, where they could go, where their expansion could be. And um, and so they were very, very naive in that respect, even though they were party bosses, and we could see all the pins he was wearing from former this, that, and the other communist organization. But to get back to your challenging question about the Middle East, uh, it's it's... Incredibly, I have traveled probably 80% of the world, but I have never actually landed, there. landed in the Middle East, yeah, except on one, not even landed. I overflew Saudi Arabia coming back from Thailand to, to Rome, but I've never really spent any time in the Middle East. And so I really don't have that good a feel only from a historical perspective and what I've read on what's going on there. But I, I just uh, I I am familiar with the things that went on during the during the Crusades, and it's amazing the the number of, of, of comparisons that apply between what happened during the Crusades and what's going on now, and and those people have a mindset that they've had for thousands of years, and. I just do not feel that the U.S. is necessarily going to change their minds in the next three years. It's too ingrained. Too ingrained, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, Russia couldn't change people's minds. We can't. I mean, there's a certain culture, and, and at some point you have to engage cultures rather than trying to bomb the tar out of them. Now, that doesn't mean people who want to blow us up should be necessarily tolerated, but... I would probably argue that that's not the feeling of most people. We have a tendency to say, well, everybody in Russia hates us, for example. Well, we probably have a tendency to say everybody in Iraq hates us. And that's, and well, that's we've just, been told. They yeah. hate us for our right. And all of them you know, are going to use Muhammad to justify these things, and, and that's probably not true. It, yeah. It's a minority like anything else, and, and the way to defeat them is an economic issue and more than anything. Just like I found and observed in, in Russia, that none of the people hate us. And we may hear uh, the politicians making all these statements, and we saw the pounding on the tables at the United Nations, and we threw all the barbs being tossed during the Cold War. But yet when you get in and meet with these people in the towns, they're the dearest, sweetest, most humble, and gracious people that you'd ever want to see. I know in, in, we were in Kiev on a trip, and this uh, gentleman, uh, they... Uh, they uh, invited us to come and stay at their house. And the next morning we said, where's the son-in-law? And they said, oh, the son-in-law, he, we found out he had slept at the train station overnight so that we could sleep in the main, the main living room area of the house. Wow. Now, if that doesn't tell you how far they'd go out, I don't know that I would go live in a, sleep in a train station so any close relative, much less a complete yeah, stranger, right. would go to my house. <laughs> well, not my, your mother my, Yeah, my, my dad, actually, uh, he's... Very comfortable at a train station when it comes to visit my house. Actually, which is... <laughs> nice, nice. This has been uh, this has been excellent. Yeah, wow, uh, you've got some such a vast wow, uh, your stories experience. I'm uh, just sucked you. in. I know. Thank you so much for sitting down with us today. It's a real honor to to be able to chat with you on our pleasure. Uh, it's really been a pleasure, and I appreciate the opportunity. And I just hope maybe some of the words I've shared with you will be useful. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> well, I don't think we got the chance to uh, plug your company, which is Forum Developments International. Correct. Okay, yes. great. And how can people get a hold of you? Do you have a website or an email address? Yeah, or? we have a website. It's www.forumdevelopmentsinternational.com. Okay. And it's undergoing some changes right now, I understand. All but, right. Uh, and we'll put that up on the website. So sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Thank you very much for joining us, everybody, for Mary and, uh, and Jamie and, and uh, Arnie Candry. Thank you so much for coming by. This has been Tuesday Noon. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the show. If you're very just important. hitting us off the website, uh, make sure to click, the, click that subscribe link. Subscribe to cool us on iTunes. Every week. Yeah, not just, right. not just the one that you're listening to now. Go yes. listen to all of them in a row. On many different computers. It'd be like like Tuesday noon all day. <laughs> Tuesday noon all day. Right. That's right. Tuesday noon marathon. That's a It, it yeah. could for you be Tuesday noon all day long. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We are out of here. This has been Tuesday Noon for October 10th, 2006, a service of University of Phoenix. For more information on the show and to subscribe, catch up with us on our website at Tuesday12.com and write us at the show at Tuesday12.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week, Tuesday Noon.